I was reading an article in Investors Chronicle about how many small businesses are going broke right now when they run out of cash. And it pissed me off because 99% of the time it could be avoided with this one simple tool. Welcome to the Dan Bradbury Podcast, the podcast that covers the critical six components in business that you need to master in order for you to grow and scale your company. Those six areas are sales, marketing, operations systems, people and culture, business finance, and legal. Today, we are going to be talking about which one, Dan? We're talking about my favorite one so far, and that's business finance. Yes, you were like a, a kid in a candy shop every six weeks when we rotate around to the business finance one. And you're heated, my friend. When we got online before the show, you seemed a little agitated because of something you had read. Well, it's ridiculous, Topher, right? I, I was reading an article in the Investors Chronicle about the number of small businesses now that are going up, that are going broke. I, what happens when they run out of cash? And it pisses me off because 99% of the time it could be avoided with one super simple tool. Okay. And you know what? Now, this this is, tool. Yeah, Go I was going to say, I think I know what this tool is, by the way, because I hear you talk about it so frequently. So let, let me see if I can guess what it is uh, to be a testament to how much you talk about this and you've jammed it down my brain. I, I uh, don't is, like this because you being a testament to anything correlated with me, it feels like a bad setup. It feels like I can only lose in this scenario. But go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, now I just want to fuck up the answer just so I can say, see, that's on you. <laughs> but here's my guess. It's not the P&L. Am I right? Correct. It's not P&L. It's, it's not the balance sheet. Nope. Nor is it the statement of cash flow. Correct. It's none of the three financial it is statements. None. That's right. And because, and honestly, I will tell you, I, mean, I got my MBA at Oxford. They never talked about the one that I hear you talk about all the time. And that is the 13 week cash flow forecast. Am Listen, right? so uh, look, you're absolutely bang on. I mean, this is absolutely outrageous. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I'll say it as it is, right? I, I, uh, to get an MBA, you're spending 100 grand, right? Like you're spending big ass money. Yeah. And the number of people, uh, people that have done MBAs, include people, even accountants, qualified accountants that have done that and then come to a one day business finance course with me and said, I learned more in that one day than I did uh, of practical business finance than I did in my MBA is ridiculous because yeah. uh, it's like I've learned more from reading uh, a book of all the Berkshire Hathaway letters to shareholders. And I believe I would have, uh, I would have done from a hundred grand MBA. I know I don't get the connections and all that kind of stuff, but I kind of go, yeah. what is the practical application? And Tova, it's useful to say uh, the backstory, the 13 week cash flow forecast is um, 10 plus years ago, I got into distressed acquisitions. Right? How do you buy, buy companies and turn them around? Right. Uh, and as part of that course, uh, it got you to think about what causes companies to go broke. And ultimately, it's only there's only one thing. They run out of cash. Mm -hmm. The definition of insolvency is unable to pay bills when they become due. Right. I mean, there's two yep. technical definitions of insolvency. One balance sheet insolvent. That's your, uh, uh, your liabilities are greater than your assets. But but ultimate cause is cash flow insolvency. You can't pay bills. They wind you up. Right. They, they, they put you into administration. They issue a winding up petition. It's so, so you run out of cash. So when you're doing a distress turnaround, uh, uh, distress turnaround, the business is going broke. You know, all these people that talk about buying businesses for a pound. Ultimately, they try people that teach that stuff, try and educate you on skills and tools uh, which you can deploy to try and separate it, protect the business, sell up, close down the bad bits, keep the good bits. And it's a complicated area of law. There's a load of charlatans, by the way, in that space. There are some good guys that know their stuff, but there's a load of absolute cowboys that I wouldn't right. go near with a barge pole. But the 100%. point is, you're going to go, okay, you're going to get a company in a mess. If you're buying a company for a pound, it's going to be a train wreck, right? There's going to be carnage everywhere. And ultimately, <laughs> yes. if you know, cash flow is like oxygen. Like a business is lasting, like you ain't getting through days or weeks really without it. Or you're not getting through month end, right? If you don't yep. pay the staff, it's over, right? So, yep. so you're going to go a cash flow forecast and it's such a simple tool. All it is is saying, okay, it tells you four things. It goes, what money is due to come in and when? 
when are you projecting it's going to come in on a weekly basis over the next quarter is how I choose to do it. You could do it over greater or lesser periods of time. Uh, and what money is due to go out? And when? And that's by that's by week. It's weekly. You should be able to see. About yeah, yeah, 12, weekly. weekly. I mean, if it's really in the shit, you could argue it's by day, right? But but like it's daily, or, or I've seen it done by daily. But in most circumstances, it's going to be weekly. It's mm. it, it's going to be it's going to be weekly, and therefore, you know, when you're going to have month end payroll, you know, when you've got your your VATs due, you know, and you can pop these things on these estimates on, and then at the at the bottom, you have the running bank balance. So if you start the bank balance is zero and you've got a hundred grand coming in week one, but you've got 120 grand going out in week one, but that is supposed to go out, then you're going to be at a negative 20 grand bank balance at the end of week one. And then that carries over to week two and three. And therefore you've got a running bank balance at the bottom. So you're projecting what you think the bank balance is going to be based upon those assumptions. Okay. Right? I got and, two and, questions for you. I got two questions for you. One question. First question. How long do you think it would take the average business owner to map out that 13 week cash flow in hours? What are we talking about? Um, depending on the complexity of business, an hour, maybe okay. two or three if it's a really complicated business. Got it. And then your advice is then every week, you basically drop off one week and you look 13 weeks out and you do the same calculation. How much Correct. time each week do you think it takes to update or maintain that cash flow forecast? For, so, I argue we've got simpler businesses and recurring revenues and stuff, so simple businesses, but for a multi-seven figure, I, I have done, do do multiple businesses, multi-seven figure businesses, and grand total of less than an hour a week for all of them. So we're talking like minutes, and some might argue you're very experienced, Dan, it's going to take me more. You know what? Maybe so it'll what? take you half a day, half a day the first time and an hour a yeah. week. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it gets habitual. But here's the point, Tofa. It's, it's all to do with stress. People make bad decisions. So right, my friend Ryan Dye says, scared money does stupid things. Uh, <laughs> and, he's, yeah. and he's spot on. So, yeah. so people get stressed and erratic and make stupid decisions. So I need to be able to see in the future. And, and it's a bit like, what's an analogy? It's a bit like people... Of really overweight so they try and go to the gym and they do the biggest workout ever and then the next day they wake up with a sore they can't move their back hurts right and it's not like the weight's not changed a little bit it's like you've got to exercise and eat right so a little bit a day consistently and then it moves and so people listen to this the funny thing is to it it's so easy and yet most listen to this don't do it and they're not going to do it right if you listen to this now and you put this into action you're one of the rare few who do and it's also the rare few businesses, right? 7% of businesses have seven figure revenues and it's estimated in the UK to be, you know, 0.2 or something of a percent of businesses, you know, one in 500, one in a thousand that make seven figure profits, right? Yeah. And, and you know what? I can't think, if I think of all the seven figure net profit owners in our, uh, in our programs, Tofa, of which are a decent mm -hmm. handful, there's not a single one of them that does not, live and die by the cash flow forecast, which sounds counterintuitive because you're going to go, these are businesses that are awash with cash, massive amounts of free cash flow. Why the hell would they keep a cash flow forecast? And I kind of go, you've got cause and effect the wrong way around. They've yep, got absolutely. all the cash because they've got that discipline, yeah. right? It's kind of like the people that are, have got the lowest body fat, so go back to the training analogy, and are in the best shape are the ones that could get away with having a binge eat. Right, and yeah. could get away with missing a workout and going a week without a workout, and it wouldn't affect it that much. But they I, don't. I can give you Why? Another, I can, yeah, I can give you another analogy. This is going to show you. This is going to show you how much I listen to you, Dan. Another scary <laughs> thought here. But I remember you sharing with me an analogy about. I think it was a friend of yours that um, was financially struggling. I think it might have been even a distant relative, like uh, one removed or something. And they were convinced that they couldn't afford something. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but you sat down with them and you essentially did a personalized version of a statement of, of, a, of a cash flow forecast in terms of how much money they would get each month on their paycheck, how much money they need to spend. And it turned out that all of this stress they had in their life about all their finances, thinking they weren't going to be able to get this thing they wanted to get you like in, in an hour, 
less than an hour, sat them down and ran through the numbers and literally eliminated all of their stress because they realized that they could get by with far less than they thought they needed. I remember you telling me that story. Well, Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I mean, yeah. I'll speak to it more because financial stress ruins people's lives, right? So, 100%. so, so uh, again, in my in my family, I, I, I won't be more specific, uh, any more specific than that. Sure. But in, in my family, there's uh, or extended family, there, it, there was uh, somebody who sadly killed themselves because of financial stress. So they committed suicide because of financial yeah. stress. And of course, in that person killing themselves, like that, they had a spouse, and so it, it just passed the burden on because they'd gotten themselves into a lot of debt, and it was a terrible set of circumstances, and and they were stressed, and they couldn't get the way out. And then the, the surviving spouse was left with this a train wreck. And don't get me wrong, there were significant problems. There wasn't enough income. There was too much outgoing to offer. But that's not the problem. That's not the problem. The actual problem was the fear and the uncertainty. Yes. And the, right. And so like when I got my teeth into it, I said, look, let's really analyze what's going on. What's you coming in and out? And, you know, it echoes with the more recent kind of cost of living crisis because, you know, that yes. thing was, you know, 10 plus years ago, but like more cost of living crisis. People are like, oh my God, my bills have tripled. I had a, I had a, another relative that was stressed because their bills got a massive house. The bills have tripled. Oh my God, it's a nightmare. Oh, I'm going to run out of money. When I looked at it, do you know what her electricity bill had gone up by? 12%. <laughs> like it didn't yeah. even move the needle. But yeah. she got Certainly herself not so triple. stressed, correct. Yeah. She got herself so stressed about what this was going to mean. And it was going to mean because she was on a relatively tight budget. She was asset rich. She was cash poor. Because she, like, she was like, oh, my God, this means I'm going to be under the water. I'm going to run out of money. And she yeah. catastrophized. And she got herself significantly. And this wasn't like something that was emotional. To her, but this was somebody yeah. where where uh, like the people around her were very concerned for her health. And there was even talk at one point about, does she need to be sectioned? You know, it was like, mm. really got herself distressed. But facts are your friend, right? Facts dispel fear when it's like, okay, this is the actual situation. And the funny thing about that electricity bill, Tofa, I'm not into rates, I don't rate, but I, I can read a utility bill. And it was like, okay, it was this, it was this. The only was. It had gone up in the in the daytime, but it, her tariff was actually going down overnight. It's just the overall net her right. bill had gone up by twelve percent, which was almost a rounding error on her like monthly cash flow. Right, right? it was yeah. like it, it changed it by you know hundred quid or whatever. Which don't get me wrong, she wasn't a high income earner, but but like so it has an impact, but certainly not something that she was destroying her life over, and yet. You might not be in that position as you're listening to this, but you're really stressed about the future. And the only reason, or I would argue the primary end reason that you're stressed is because you're worried about what that means from a cash perspective. Whether 100%. that be whether that be my profit's going to go down and therefore there's going to be less for me, or whether it means I'm going to be loss making and I'm not going to be able to pay bills, or whether that means I'm going to have to let people go. But really, it's because you've got an assumption about what's going to happen with your cash and if you actually do the bloody cash flow forecast, I cannot even tell you what proportion of the time people are radically misguided. And then the best bit over is, and you're right, you can just wind me up and let me go on this one. The best bit, the best bit on this one's over is, I'm gonna go. You go, okay, it's it, like let's say it's nowhere near as bad as you thought. Well, that's great news, and and you'll feel the instant relief. But okay, I've definitely done it, Tofa, and on a, on a good number of occasions, it's worse than somebody feared. Sure. Okay. Here's the question. Where's the disadvantage in that, that it's worse than you feared? I, I, I'll say it in an inelegant way. Mm -hmm. If I've got cancer, how soon do I want to know about it? The, when it's in stage one. Even earlier, uh, like, when it's like a little yesterday, tiny dot. like yeah. correct. I want to know as early as possible. Like, yeah. and that's you know my view. And I, I want to be clear. I you know I've got relatives with cancer, so I'm not making light of a serious condition. I'm doing the analogy. I kind of like yeah. if there's a serious problem that could kill the patients, yeah. it's like the sooner you know about it, the sooner you can fix it. The sooner you can yeah. do an intervention. 
right? And it, it, it obviously cancer that might that's treatment, right? But but the um uh but in business, like if you're gonna run out of cash, you're gonna have a significant cash problem. I want to know as soon as possible so I can yeah. stop unnecessary spending. 100%. I can but, raise cash. I can yeah. right. I, I can give you uh, the, the inverse to that as well, right? It's like um, uh, our friend Mike Michalowicz talks about bank balance accounting, right? How pe business owners so often look at how much money they got in their bank and they go, I got money, I can afford it. And what you're saying there is the is, is the aspect of that, right? Where it's, if it's worse than you think it is, but you happen to have money right now and you're driving your car, looking at the end of your bonnet, not all the way down that road, you might go, oh, I've got all the money in the world for this thing. But if you go out four weeks, you realize, oh, shit, I need that money in four weeks, though. It makes you smarter in what you're doing financially today as well. So it's correct. It, there's yeah, there's the benefit of stress, getting a, a realistic check, but also just making smarter decisions based upon what's coming down that road. Brilliant. Well, that's it. It goes both ways, right? So I had a board of advisors meeting last two days. Great group, right? And, and now in this group, so again, you know, from six, uh, from seven to eight figure uh, revenue business owners, Uber, like 40, 50, 60% net margins to businesses that are more productized and therefore it might be 10% margin, yeah. right? So like different different types, different sky, international, local, service-based, product-based, so a variety. So a real good eclectic mix, which by the way, always makes for the most dynamic, best meetings, right? True innovation never comes from in your own sector. It comes from, oh, wow, that's a unusual uh, perspective but there are both extremes at both ends of the cash flow spectrum the, the second order consequences right so yep. so obviously if people are light on cash and normally whatever you're doing people tend to be naive the people that are light on cash they go oh yeah i'm going to make this spend anyway it's going to be good and people go whoa, whoa 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 let's plan ahead think about this what could happen but the opposite is also true so there was I'm thinking of one uh, person in particular who was in there. This business super profitable. This year might be their first seven-figure net profit year, but it's either way. It's very high six figures, net, 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 net. They've got well past seven figures clear cash in the bank, like unencumbered cash, right? So yeah. great. So they've got good retained earnings, good liquidity. Like it's it's the cost of running the business are low, so they've got significant liquidity, and so they're going great. What do I do with all this money? Right. And it's a smart question. If you've got surplus cash, how are you going to deploy that capital? Because inflation eats away at it. Great. To a point. But all of a sudden it's like, well, what does that mean? If you've got a million spare, do you invest what? A million? Or do you invest 100 grand? Or do you invest 500? Right. 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 Like, how much do you keep as a reserve, as a yes. safety net? Right. I, I can't be prescriptive because it depends on so many factors here. Sure. But a couple of other people in the group said to this individual listen don't over egg it don't because what happens is when people are making all this money they go oh what could go wrong and they start they loosen the dial and they invest in this then they invest in that and they and, and unfortunately the bigger your business gets it's like a tanker it takes longer to like change direction right when there's an iceberg ahead and so two people in that business excuse me two people in the room said very similar that have been around a long time they went listen when it changes right now, uh, uh, let's call this person Tim. Tim, mm -hmm. right now, you're on a huge, epically good run. Nothing can go wrong. That's a problem. That hubris is going to punch you in the goddamn face. Yeah. And what's going to happen is you can't foresee a time when you're going to need that cash, but it's going to come. And I'd rather maximize, optimize for your survival if you're wrong the maximize your upside if you're right, right? Like the, the, you, you, you got to stay in the game. I'd rather sacrifice some upside return I could have got if I invested every single penny that I've got. Because what happens is when when it starts turning, when the business starts going downhill, always coincides with when your personal investments start going to shit, and when you get when you get hit with a random tax inspection, and yeah. when you get divorced. Right. Like it's, you know, people say it comes in threes. And I don't mean this from a uh, superstitious point. Oh, it comes in threes and it all happens. But what often happens is unconsciously. You know, what's that mean, Toby? You've seen it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's something like good it's people. Avail yeah, it's good the availability people create, Yeah, it is. So the meme something yeah. like, uh, 
you know, good people get lazy, lazy people create weak people, weak people oh, create oh, the, bad uh, times. Yeah, uh, right. uh, hard, hard times make strong people, strong people make great times, great times make lazy people, lazy people make hard times, hard times make strong people. It's just a right, cycle. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so effectively, when your business is doing great, it's like, oh, you take your foot off lazy. the pedal and yeah. then you, you get in the shit. So every single business owner that I know, Tova, that is consistent in making seven figures net. So it's sustainable. Yeah. They've sustained seven figures net and therefore, you know, they are uh, multi-millionaires or deca-millionaires. Uh, um, every single one of them is militant to a level that you would not believe on their cash flow forecast. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's move that into the action of the week for those listeners and the viewers, which is to create a 13 week cash flow. Now, some people might be watching this or listening to this going, I don't even know where to start. So let's give some real rudimentary, basic steps that we could do uh, to create that 13 week cash flow or at least get it, uh, a rough estimate going on. Yeah, great. Listen, so I I'll say it on here because I know some people are too lazy to click a link. But uh, we'll make a note. We'll put it in the show code, uh, uh, in the show, show notes. notes. So for, 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 I did a financial literacy course. It was eight modules in it. One of them was specifically about this topic. Let me first give a disclaimer. I'm going to explain this. And then loads of people are going to message in and ask for a template. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you go and get, follow the link, great. We'll give you a link to a template and you can do it. But just know it's not in the goddamn template. You could go to Google right now and Google 13 week cash flow forecast template and you'd get a thousand of them, yeah. right? It's not the template. It's, it's, it's in training yourself to have the, uh, discipline, do the process. It's the discipline. It's yeah. kind of like, oh, you can have the best workout plan you've ever seen. You can have the best yeah. personal trainer you've ever seen. What's going to make the difference in your body is going to the goddamn gym, right? Yeah. Like if you are four stone overweight, I don't know why I'm on a health and fitness metaphor this week, but if you're four stone overweight, it's kind of like, you know what, your consistency of going to the gym and doing 30 minutes of cardio is way more important than you having the most nuanced, complicated plan of all time, right? That you do one once every seven years. Give me a goddamn I, I, I want to jump in real quick because I want to make sure people don't get lost in this metaphor. Dan is not saying what's more important is making the money. What Dan is saying is what's more important is the discipline of sitting down and trying to muck through the 13-week cash flow. That's the discipline. That's the running aspect of it yes yeah yeah nobody said it differently nobody cares more about your money than you do like pay attention it's cause and effect as keith cunningham would say if the effect is missing so is the cause people mm -hmm. want loads of money but they're not prepared to do what they need to do to get the money and you know what like if you pay attention to your cash flow all of a sudden you'll find where you're wasting money You'll find where there's some expenses where you're overpaying. Oh, yeah, you're gonna, right? And, and it's death by a thousand cuts. You cut some of those expenses, but you'll also see where some customers are late paying. You'll also see where your sales isn't optimized. And that kind of, like, in every industry, Tofa, there's people that are making a killing and there's people that are going broke. And people go, oh, I've been in the right industry. Oh, well, look, industries do rise and fall, but it doesn't matter the industry the difference between people that run great businesses and the the, the weak businesses and that like, is orders of magnitude. Any industry, you know, you, you, like training companies is an example. There's plenty of training companies which are typically super high margin service based businesses. There's plenty of those companies that make no money and go broke or have single digit margins. And then there's plenty that, that have got upwards of 50 percent net margins, despite being seven or eight figure revenues. Yeah. Okay, so it's not the industry, it's how you run the goddamn business. Yeah. And I tell you, the ones who've got the ones who've got multi double digit margins and that is an absolute cash cash cow, I I would bet hard money, and I'm not a betting man, but those people are the ones that are the most financially literate and they're dialed in. They're not the muppets who just go, oh, let's sell some more, then we'll make more money. You know what? Yeah. You can't outrun stupid. <laughs> and the, the thing that I find funny is that the number of people that are epic at marketing, and I know because I was one of these people that are epic at marketing that grow their revenues, but somehow there's never any bloody money yeah. because they can't manage it. They can bring it in, but it goes out just as quick. And you know what? Those people end up broke. 
All right. Well, listen, in the spirit of you can't outrun stupid, let's talk about another discipline that you and I are very militant about, which is the discipline of reading to getting better and smarter in your business, in your life. Let's talk about the book of the week. So, Tova, I have a guilty pleasure, right? And I shouldn't vibe with that because that just tees you up for all kinds of jokes. So, so, so I, yeah, I have a guilty except for I have the same guilty pleasure, so I can't even think ahead to insult you because I'm guilty with it. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 like, uh, you know, uh, my 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 trash reading is, I like reading uh, not fiction, but I like reading non-fiction financial fraud. You know, some people oh, read okay. ro romance, some people read romance novels, some yeah. people be, read mystery. I like reading about companies where massive fraud has happened and massive collapse, and because I like understanding how it happened. Yes, you do. You're weird about that. And I want to clarify, I don't share that same guilty pleasure. I thought we were just talking about the context of reading business over pleasure books. But yes, you are right. You do love reading all of those weird forensic financial accounting. Well, I want to be clear. It's not forensic accounting. It's kind of like if you want to talk about the collapse of Enron, if you want to talk yeah. about like, like name a big company uh, that has gone bust, right? Or like big scams or charlatans. Or if, you, if you want to talk about... Um, uh, what's his name? Billion Dollar Loser. Uh, what was the? Oh yeah, the guy, guy from WeWork. Yeah. Yeah, WeWork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, right now. Mm -hmm. I like understanding what they did because it, it kind of inoculates me against fraud happening. Sure. Yeah. I, I want to understand how that game is played, and this book is in that category. But it's a great read, and I, I think it's a light read. But it's also educational from a financial point of view. And mm -hmm. this book's called The Signs Were There by Tim Steer. And this book is not one company, but multiple companies. It talk it talks about multiple um, big uh, uh, big company failures. Um, uh, I think this one's all UK actually, um, and, and so like well known ones. And it talks about how, in hindsight, it was obvious. It was there yes. in the financial statements, right? Yeah. Um, Enron's not in this book, but the same is true of Enron. If you look at Enron's financial statements for the last three years, and you knew how to read financial statements. Mm -hmm. It was blatantly obvious, and actually a lot of the really heavy hitters, the Warren Buffetts of this world, were like, I wouldn't touch this with a barge pole because the fundamentals were so screwed up. But yeah. the average marketplace was uh, blindsided by the PR machine and the, oh, we're making loads of profit. We're making loads of profit, but we've got ridiculous negative operating cash flow. Ding, 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 ding. And if you're listening right now, you're like, I don't know what negative operating cash flow means. Read the book. Read the book. Right, right, exactly. It's kind, of, it's kind of going, if you're out of cash, you're dead. And yeah. so I want to understand those signs for my business, for looking out for fraud. And this book gives several high-profile examples of big companies that have gone bust that you know about, that, but gives you the financial, what was going on behind the scenes at the time and how you could have started it. All right. I love that. You know what? You've mentioned that book to me several times, and I've not yet read that one. This is inspiring me now. I want to make sure I get that book and read it. So uh, you can hold me accountable. Make sure that by the next time we get around in six weeks to the next finance podcast, I've read that book and we can have a conversation about it. All right, my friend, let's move on to the quote of the week. So I feel in this backstory and it's funny in this finance, I've got a story for everyone. So this quote comes from Harry Singleton. So most people don't know who Harry is, but if they read a previous book of the week from a long time ago called The Outsiders, The Outsiders were talking about people, CEOs that have run companies, uh, Fortune 500 companies, I think, and they've managed to maintain above a 20% rate of return or, or increase in stock price, I think, on an annualized basis for more than a decade. It might be two decades. So in other words, who are the heaviest weight CEOs in history, right? And mm -hmm. it's, in a, <coughs> it's in a book called The Outsiders. And um, Warren Buffett's one of these kind of eight or 12 CEOs. Several of the companies Berkshire Hathaway owns are the other CEOs, which tells you how Warren Buffett effectively did it. But the number one CEO of all time by the definition, that definition, which I bastardized a bit, but there's at the start of the book is Harry Singleton. Harry Singleton. So Harry Singleton uh, 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 ran a company, a conglomerate called Teledyne from the, I think from the sixties, might be from the fifties to the late eighties mm -hmm. or 1990. So, like, he, but he was very under the radar. You never heard of him. And it, But how he operated the company was based on everything we just spoken about. And it's summarized in this quote. Okay. And that quote was this. Our accounting is set to maximize cash flow, 
not reported earnings. Smoothing reported earnings just has to take a back seat. In other words, he was a publicly listed company. So he's saying, I don't actually care about the profits that we declare. I'm not going to play the games that most CEOs go, oh, no, 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 we have to project a profit and then make sure we hit that number so we don't upset the shareholders. He went, I don't give a shit about any of that. I just want to maximize cash flow. How much cash does it, how much cash does this business spin off? Yeah. And that's all he did. He maximized cash flow and then he took that cash flow to hell with what the stock market thought in the short term. He was like, my goal in the long term is to maximize wealth for myself and my fellow shareholders. So all I'm going to do is get maximum amount of cash and then I'm going to use that cash to buy other companies. And he was an aggressive buyer of other companies and he did that. And so he had one of the biggest co companies in the United States no and his family is still one of the richest families in the United States, even though you've pretty much nobody's ever heard of him. All right, my friend. Well done. Well, listen, um, uh, th this is a good podcast. I think we've given them one very strong, clear task, which is to create your 13 week cash flow, go through the process of that struggle through it, take a half day if you need to, and then every week drop one off, bring one on. Um, uh, next week, we are going to be talking about, my friend, operations and systems. So make sure if you're listening or watching, you tune into that as well. Um, having said that, let's wrap it up and get out of here, my friend. So as always, Tova, if you want a better business, if you never want to have to worry about money again, you need to get educated financially. And so if you want a better business, you need to be a better business owner. I'm into that. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Three things you need to do now. Number one, make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you do not miss an episode. Also, get on over to Amazon to get a copy of my latest book, Turnover is Vanity, Profit is Sanity, Nine and a Half Steps to Improving Your Profits and Cash Flow. Also, join our Facebook group, the Turnover is Vanity, Profit is Sanity community to connect with other business owners.